Why do bows break? And how can we avoid it? Today we'll be approaching this issue by making a bow out of some bad bow wood. A cedar furring strip. And then we'll torture test it all the way to failure and hopefully learn something along the way. I'm going to keep working on the bow in the background. And meanwhile, I'll talk you through the five most common reasons why most bows break. Chapter 1. Wood Selection With low-density woods like pine, poplar, and cedar, you have to lower the draw weight or make your bow wider or longer. These woods have less wood in the wood, so you have to compensate somehow. Now it's true that for a design-fluent bowyer, you can always change the stats of the bow to get around these characteristics of the wood. So you can make a bow out of anything, if you're willing to change the design. But it's also true that if you simply use a better piece of wood, that's a cheap and easy way to get yourself a lot of extra margin for error. Now part of that means choosing a reputable bowwood species that's proven itself over time. Something like hickory, oak, ash, elm, yew, osage, hazel, laburnum, etc. The other key aspect of wood selection is that you need to pick a board or a stave with no violation along the back. That means you need a clean strip of fibers all the way from one end of the board to the other, without interruptions and without the fibers running off the sides. You need those fibers to span all the way because if they stop in the middle, when you pull on the bow, those fibers might lift up and form a splinter, cascading into the entire bow breaking. So we've covered how you can use wood selection to gain more margin for error in your build, whether that means choosing a reputable bowwood species, or a board with no violations along the back. Now let's cover how to approach the same thing through design, by embracing high margin for error designs. Chapter 2. Margin for Error Things never go exactly perfectly in bow making. You need to leave yourself enough room for the mistakes you're going to make. And if you're just getting started in the craft, you need to leave yourself even more room. The easiest way to add margin for error to your builds is with a longer or a wider bow. But you can also drop the target draw weight, and if you're comfortable shooting with a lower draw length, then you can drop that too. You should also avoid designs with a high amount of complexity, like recurves and reflex. One of the most common design mistakes that I see beginners making is opting for a bow that's way too short for their skill level. Experienced bowyers like to push their designs and tillering skills by making bows as short as they can manage. But if you're getting started, you need all the margin for error you can get. There's a good chance you won't make it to the finish line, and you shouldn't make things harder for yourself. Especially if you're coming over from fiberglass recurves, and especially ones with a huge riser. You probably think that long bows are very uncomfortable to maneuver through the woods. But with straight stave designs, that's really not true. I haven't found that it's an issue carrying bows even over 70 inches long. The annoyingness of carrying a larger bow through the woods is really something that plagues recurve specifically, and I think it's something you should ignore if you're making straight stave bows, because a little bit of extra length will give you a lot of extra margin for error. But people seem to be very afraid of adding this extra length because they're worried about carrying the bow, but it's really not an issue. Straight stave bows are easy to weave through the woods. The biggest advantage of a longer bow is how much more forgiving they are to tiller. Which brings us to chapter three, the tiller. The goal in tillering is to smoothly distribute the bending so that no one part of the bow is any more overworked. If you've designed the bow well, you should be pulling each portion of the bow as far as you can without seeing set. Now there are two aspects to having good tiller. The first is that the tiller shape of your bow matches the profiles of your bow. Now that's a little bit more of an advanced topic. The other aspect you need to consider with your tiller is just whether the bend is smooth without any obvious hinges. If you're having trouble with hinges, you may want to try out a tillering gizmo or my friend Aaron G. Webster's No Gas Tillering Method. I'll put links down to both in the description of the video. The No Gas Tillering Method is especially nice for character bows, and the gizmo is really nice for avoiding hinges if you've been having trouble with the basics of tillering. The reasons that I don't like a gizmo are that it forces you into circular tiller, which may not apply well to every bow. Most bows call for some form of elliptical tiller, where the bending radius tightens as you go from inner limb to outer limb. That's because the outer limbs are thinner and they can afford to bend to a tighter radius without taking set. The problem is if you use a gizmo on one of these bows, you might force a circular tiller, and this will put an extra amount of stress on the inner limbs while leaving stiff mid and outer limbs. Another thing that can really help if you're struggling with the tiller is to post a tiller check on an online bowmaking forum. All you have to do is post the front profile, side profile, and drawn picture, and experienced members will be able to give you quality feedback. 
Don't just post one picture, or we'll have to make guesses and won't be able to give a complete evaluation. In general, bowmaking forums are really friendly about this, and if you ask for a tiller check, you'll get help. If you want my help in particular, post on the Reddit forum, r slash bowyer, and I'll drop in when I can. Feel free to post as many as you need. It's really helpful for the community to see other people's bows getting tillered. Chapter 4. Set. You know when you pull a rubber band too far, and it won't snap back all the way to the original shape? That's pretty similar to set. This is when you overstress the wood, and you exceed the elastic limit of the material. Well before your bow ever breaks, it will start to take set, and if you ignore the set, your bow might break before you realize. A little bit of set is always natural, but too much can be a sign that you have a problem with your wood selection, design, or tiller. As I said, set is a sign that your wood is overstressed. It can be a tip that maybe you should lower your target draw weight, or opt for a shorter draw length. It can also be a sign that next time, you might want to design your bow longer or wider, or try to do a better job with the tiller. Unfortunately, the best way to deal with set is prevention, with good design and tiller. Set happens when the belly fibers in the wood get crushed on a microscopic scale. You can use heat to change the string follow of the bow, but set is permanent, and while you can hide it, the set is always there. You can't simply uncrush those wood fibers. You'll often hear experienced bowyers complaining about woods like hickory and elm being very susceptible to set. While this is a detriment to performance, you can fix it with heat treating and with proper drying of the wood. That's another matter though. The other aspect to consider is that this is a great beginner-friendly feature. Most white woods are not only very tension strong, which makes them hard to break, but they also take a lot of set before they break, which gives you a huge amount of warning sign, letting you know that you're overstressing the material. This is a great feature and a great reason to choose woods like hickory, ash, and elm when you're just getting started. Certain other woods like Osage and Yew don't have the same susceptibility to set, but they tend to take less set before breaking and they tend to break more catastrophically. So these very set-prone whitewoods are actually very beginner-friendly. It's much better to have your bow take set rather than break. Chapter 5. Performance Greed When it comes to performance features, it's easy to bite off more than you can chew. You might have heard that reflex and recurves make your bow shoot faster. Now that can be true if you nail the design and execution, but if you don't have a lot of experience, chances are you might make a better shooting bow with a simple straight stave design. I've seen a lot of first time bowyers make really nice straight stave designs, but I almost never see a nice recurve made on the first try. On your first bow, you really want to spend your time learning the fundamentals of bow making, rather than troubleshooting advanced issues, like you'll have to deal with if you make a recurve. Once you're capable designing and tailoring straight stave bows for low set, then you'll be ready to increase the amount of stress on the wood and go for those recurves and reflex bows. Anytime you choose a performance feature, you should be aware that this is adding extra stress to the wood and that you should counterbalance that stress with extra margin for error, such as wider or longer bending limbs. All right, so those were the top five most common reasons why bows break. Now I think we're ready to get onto the torture test. So what did I learn about using cedar? Well, you can use it. It does make a bow, but it's really tough to use. I made a very long bow and I only got about 20 pounds of draw weight out of it. You can tell that when I shot it, I was not pulling it to full draw and I really didn't trust the bow. But when I pulled the bow to failure, it took a lot more than I expected to break it. I even had to add an extra yardstick to the tiller tree. I think this is a good example to show that marginal bow woods are usable, but there are caveats. You may have to lower the draw weight, you may have to make a longer or a wider bow, and you may not trust the results. Now the fact that the bow took so long to break is also a win for wood selection, and shows how much margin for error you gain by choosing a good board with end-to-end -end fibers all the way across the back. Even though this bow didn't have a perfect tiller, it did have a few issues. It took over 40 inches of draw to break the thing.
All right, that's all for today. I hope you learned something, and I hope this video helps you cut down on some breaks in the future. Thanks for watching and subscribing. I'll see you next time, and until then, may your arrows fly true.